Welcome to the Assistant Lab podcast, hosted by Victoria Ratton and Arnel Martin. This podcast is dedicated to the executive assistant profession, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've created this podcast for the outliers, the linchpins, the assistants who are serious about their careers. This is a podcast for those who are preparing for the future today. This is a space for no-nonsense content, benchmarking and tracking industry and world trends, as well as interesting interviews with exceptionally inspirational people. The goal here is to stimulate new ways of thinking and being in this profession. So, on with the show. Welcome to the next episode of the Assistant Lab. This week, another really super inspiring and motivating interview, especially for those of you that are looking to make that transition um, to the virtual assistant world, which is another part of our industry that many of you might have already made that transition. I This interview is with Abigail Language and she owns Poppins PA. She comes from a PA background It's not what her initial career was, but she fell into the role and started a a career as a legal PA. And she navigated those waters, um, getting married, becoming a mum of three. So I really um, got into the nitty gritty of what it was really like making the transition from PA to VA, why she did it, it, what it's like um, being a mum. And, you know, commuting in and out the city and then taking those risks with self-employment where we don't know how much we're going to earn from one month to the next. Uh, something I know only too well, as does now. I think the beauty of this interview is Abigail has been completely raw and honest. She talks openly about what's worked, her failures, this unwavering and belief in herself and the fact that it's actually OK to be ambitious. So Enjoy. Good morning, Abby, and welcome to the Assistant Lab. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. And I know that you know Anel really, really well. And obviously, I'm riding solo for the the next few episodes because she's undertaking a very stressful move right across South Africa. Mm. Um, And and I thought moving in the UK was stressful, but actually, after hearing some of her recent stories, I don't think we've got a patch on SA. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's going through a really stressful time. So, yeah, so yeah. So I decided to take the load off a bit and, and undertake these interviews. But obviously, I've got to know you really, really well over the last year. So I'm really excited um, that you've come on with me today. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for asking. Ah, pleasure. So let's get right into it. At the moment, and we'll go back through your entire history, but at the moment, you run a business called Poppins PA. So how did that come about? What does it do? What are your services? Tell us everything about it. Um. Right, without trying to go into war and peace. Um, (laughs) So I started as a legal PA um, back in the day when we used to have the audio types. I saw your post about that yesterday. Wasn't Um, that funny? It was so funny. (laughs) So yeah, it was nice to have a physical tape, wasn't it? So yeah, I started as a legal PA back when they were around in local solicitors near where I am in Medway in Kent. Um, And I then, I just was doing my thing, was quite... I wouldn't say happy because I didn't always wanted to be a PA. It's something that I kind of fell into after um, dropping out of university doing a law degree. Um, but that might be another story. So I was, but I was, I was fairly happy. I liked the true essence of a PA role, but I worked in conveyancing. So it probably wasn't the right area at the time. Mm. Um, but after I'd met my husband, we'd had our first child. I then wanted to go back into London because I've always had this, kind of seed of me that's actually really ambitious that just wanted to do something with it I've never been one that can just go in do my thing come home and that's it it's all mm. I've always wanted more and at the time I thought London was where it was at so I went to London got a part-time role um with a large international law company who I was with just under 10 years um and it for the first five or six years it was really really good because I was um a PA to the head of national employment in the company. Um, the guy that I worked for was wonderful, really flamboyant and um, really made the PA role come alive from his point of view. Because although I ran his diary and was gatekeeper and stuff, I also helped liaise with the building contractors that was renovating his barn out in Norfolk. And 
doing the personal element stuff of being the personal assistant, which is where I've always, always thrived. And that element has not ever left me alone, hence now doing Poppins PA. So working for Tom in employment was great, but then things changed. I think I had, by the time I'd had my daughter, I'd then gone back and I had to go into pensions. Um, and even by the nature of it, I'm sure some people get excited about pensions. I'm not one of those <laughs> people. And it was just something that it just started to go downhill for me. I'm quite lively. I love talking to people and pensions was just a lot more withdrawn and well, it's pensions. So anyway, I stayed there for four or five years. Again, all of this, my entire career was two days a week, Mondays and Tuesdays um, in London. Can I just ask a quick question? Like, yeah. obviously, you know, I'm, I used to say I'm childless, but now apparently it's child free. Um, but like, I'm just so in awe of all, I know you parents always say, oh, well, you just get on with it and you made it. How, was there like a fundamental difference between child one to child two in terms of the childcare costs and your energy? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, commuting into any city in the UK and especially London, it's, tiring like I found it exhausting and I don't didn't have to get home for children how did you manage all that and um so I was part-time which obviously helped I couldn't have done full-time because of the childcare element so we me and my husband have only ever managed um between us because although Mark's mum my husband's mum helped a lot with our first child Charlie um she was quite open and said, I mean, I've had my children and I don't particularly want to go through that again. Happy to help, but I'm not going to start being one of the grandmas that looks after them, you know, the entire day. And that was absolutely fair enough. And there I didn't have children in order to do that myself. I didn't want to work full time. Yeah. Albeit I really, really needed to because for the entire time in London, but I'm quite happy to be honest about it. I just broke even. I wasn't really making any money because of the childcare element. But that little seed come back again. I wasn't prepared to be at home and lose all that experience that I'd had to wait until, you know, the kids were however old and then get back in the work game again to then earn pennies when I knew I was better than that. Keeping your finger in that pie was so important, so important that it made me break even for a very long time. But it gave me that independence. It gave me that away from motherhood because as much as I love being a mum, I absolutely adore being me and Abby and having that time on the train. And I think that really enhances your role as a mum because you're reading things outside of what you're going to be mashing up for dinner and whether it's going to be butternut squash and spinach tonight for them or, mm. you know, there's something outside of the Annabelle Carmel world. And I think it takes a long time sometimes for mums to realise that that is absolutely OK. And that is very much the DNA of what I do now. So what I um what I did was just run the kind of run London into the ground. So I'd had Charlie, Sophia, and then we'd had Edward. And there's four years between them, but I'm obviously constituting it. Um, and by the time we'd had Edward, I was at the point where I didn't like my job at all um, because they had a major, major overhaul of PAs within the firm. I don't know if it was across the board. You'd probably be a better person to let me I know. It was yeah. around. 2013 2014 it was around that time that was like the second and third around about that was the second and word uh, third run of like restructuring in especially in corporate and law firms because right, we well. that initial from the global financial recession then they did it again a few years later and then again so yeah it was probably around then um and they made us glorified admin assistants basically they took away all casework so we had no uh, liaison again with any solicitors any external parties um and again that took away so much of the the personality to the job that that's that's why I loved the job that's why I did stick it out for such a long time because I loved sort of running the lawyers lives in that way but the lawyers took it back because then they could claim more for the case and obviously earn money or more money as a business so I knew why they did it but archiving making tea is not what I'm about there's only so many days that you can archive on oh, billing billing absolutely melted my brain I hated it it's not my strong point even though we had a system that did it I hated it I absolutely and even now running my business I still hate it <laughs> um, 
but anyway so I'd had my third within hours even less than that hours of having him I remember explicitly I can see it now looking out of the window of the Medway hospital and then I'd, I'd, I'd completely resigned I wasn't going back because I knew that if I'd gone back I would have gone into depression because although I wasn't quite depressed I knew that I would have started to get depressed it would have affected my home life so at the time to go back and do six months I got a maternity bonus so I'd agree with Mark that I go back get my bonus and then in that six months I would try and organize something else which is where I built my website found out about the whole concept of virtual assistance which I had never ever heard of um, I mean I had no work to do since they took all the legal work away a lot of the diary management went and I was kind of like well I don't really know what to do and they knew I didn't have a lot of work to do I was almost begging for redundancy I wasn't redundant I was just making tea um, so I'd go in so what I did was use that time to research and just look at where else, where else can I go and at the time I had such a fixed mindset because I was only looking at other law firms I only thought I could go to another law firm which is crazy um I went for other interviews in my lunch hour didn't get any and I think I didn't get any because they knew I didn't actually want the job because I didn't actually want the job my energy levels must have been really low and I must have been going like yeah just employ me just employ me and I might you know I must have had it written across my face you can't for any good interviewer and HR professional that's been trained properly on interviewing you just cannot hide it um yeah exactly candidate, you can see that from the candidate yeah so, exactly yeah. so it was a, a blessing for both both sides that I didn't leave uh, I didn't get a new job because it just would have been moving the problem mm. so anyway the six months came around I left just didn't want to I didn't want to keep in touch with anyone well a couple of the other PAs that I, I knew but you know I, I'd, I'd absolutely had it I'd run out of steam just a it. quick question were any of the other assistants in the firm at the time having gone through the same change were they feeling similar to you or were they quite yeah. happy to continue going in and one of them had moved into a fee earning role um which would have been available for me if I was going to work more days a week so I yeah. had told the firm that I wanted to work three days a week and go up um, a day mm. but it wasn't possible whether they were saying it wasn't possible, we'd rather you just leave, possibly, mm. because I was always a bit of a black sheep. So in meetings, I wouldn't always tell them what they wanted to hear. I mean, you know me, Vic. It's I don't do that in general. I don't do that in life. It's probably why we get on so well because <laughs> I'm totally. I've been the black sheep throughout my entire. Work. And, I, and I've said before, I can't believe our paths haven't haven't crossed because yeah. I know that my life would have been so much better professionally that had we met you know 15 yeah, years ago um but yeah so in meetings and things like that I would often just say well that makes the absolutely no sense at all and the whole room would just look and I would just say I'm not doing that I'm not doing that that's ridiculous and Donna our uh, like team leader if you like was like oh my god um like take an annual leave when one of my children is it was was off sick I wouldn't take it as annual leave um, it's not a holiday I'm not having a great time mm -hmm. Charlie's got chicken pox and I used to make them put it down as unauthorized absence or whatever it was I didn't so the little things like that I was never set to be an employee forever because I just for, as I got older I just started to kind of break away that it was like I was a caged animal it was just but at the same time, I felt like I had so much potential, but I didn't know where to put it. I didn't know where it was, what it was. So I felt really, really frustrated. So anyway, I'd done all this research of being a VA um, and one of my friend's husbands set me up a really basic website and I designed it really badly. Um, and I was known as Virtually Abbey back then, which I choke on because I don't even really like the name. It's awful. But it started me on this journey so I started networking how I found out about networking um in London I don't know on one of my many searches but because I was in the legal industry again I only thought I could network with other legal people so I was at the Royal Courts of Justice and I started networking with barristers and QCs and people like that self-practitioners within the legal world basically um 
and I was just talking to them and it opened that door on oh my god there are so many more people in the world that don't that aren't employed and it was like I'd found sliced bread mm -hmm. it was just it was such a bizarre concept so I had picked up a couple of those clients didn't have an absolute clue what I was doing but I thought well as long as I know what I'm doing with the work I'll just work out what to do with the rest which is basically how a business is run for anyone that I know, yeah. you know and I know that now um and that went on for probably about two years um and oh, again I wasn't really making any money because I didn't particularly know what I was doing and like the financials as I've already highlighted wasn't a strong point of mine but it's taken me a long time to get to this point but then you know I've, I've done it around the family it's not something I've been able to do full-time or really wanted to do full-time I would like to work more but I really rein myself in because children grow up quick we get older quick so I'm very mindful that don't sit on my laptop all the time because it will still be there in five years time but the kids probably won't be yeah um so that I do find a struggle did um, you um, did you in those first couple of years you were talking about where you were like trying, trying to find your feet did you um have trouble which a lot of virtual assistants who are successful now have mm -hmm. identified but with that whole pricing mantra and um mm -hmm. am I giving too much away clients um taking more than the allocated hours the retainer rate did you struggle with any of that in the beginning yeah I mean I I like many people when we start out on our own I listened and basically copied what everyone else was doing mm. because you instantly think well they're doing it seems to be working for them so I'll just charge what they charged because you don't know your own worth when you're out on your own and you're freelancing because you're worth vulnerable. yeah absolutely you're told what your worth is in your employment contract yeah that that's your worth why would you have your own worth when you're a number in a multinational law firm mm -hmm. um so I I think my start rate was 25 and it was for a very very long time um and that's not a bad rate to be honest when you start out um and no one particularly quibbled it um but if they did I think I did lower it you kind of like think oh god okay so they're a lawyer that they must know what they're talking about they earn hundreds of pounds an hour so I think I dropped it to like 22 for a couple of people. Um, I wouldn't dream of dropping my rate for anyone now, regardless of who they are. Mm. But you learn so much um, that the whole you don't know what you don't know concept is so real. And at any stage of your business as well, I don't think it matters what stage of your business you're at. If you don't know it, you don't know it. Yeah. So, And it doesn't make you precious that you don't know it. You just have to own it that actually do you know what I know it now next time I need to bear it in mind um I think one of the common mistakes because I've made so many mistakes mm. running a small business I mean it's literally monumental um and I've got no qualm about being open about that with people um but I just think well there's this vulnerability especially when you come out of a big law firm or a big FTSE company like I did you've gone from having departments of people to do the PR and you know marketing and IT and then literally you are on your own mm -hmm. um, having to fix and learn everything so that I think that's one of the positives of running a business that you do have to learn mm -hmm. more than you'd ever learn running being in a corporate um, yeah. or law firm there's that part um there's there's the kind of imposter syndrome I think which some people are saying doesn't exist now as it I think it does and of I think that's there I also had this because I'd worked at the highest levels and I'd had this very high profile um amazing EA career which a lot of assistants used to say Vic I want to be like you and I'd say why um but then I I think there was some naivety in me making that transition to being a small business owner that because I'd sat in boardrooms and I'd supported all these hotshot CEOs that I was going to easily transition into being a, a business owner and oh my god did I fall on my face like and I I see this with a lot of VAs they um you know my social feeds and I've tried to get clients can't I'm sh closing up I've tried to this and when you talk to some of them you realize that actually they've had that same naivety that because they've been a PA and EA in a business they think that they can run a business it's completely different it's two different mm -hmm. mindsets 
It's yeah, and it is absolutely huge. It really is. Um, and it's it's such a shame because a lot of the EAs and PAs that and VAs and of our, that I've spoken to, their skill set is fantastic. Mm. But the biggest thing is putting yourself out there and consistently putting yourself out there. That I would say is the biggest lesson I have learned and still find the hardest to keep up with because you naturally think well I've put a post out I've put a post out no no one's seen it that's it no one's seen it no one likes me no one wants to buy my stuff but you have got to be putting yourself out there every single day now instantly your imposter syndrome I call mine Karen will kick <laughs> in and go you're doing it too much people will get sick of you no one wants to hear about it no one wants to buy your stuff. Why are you doing it again? All this stuff will come through your head. Mm. You've got to push through it. And when I say put yourself out there every single day, I don't necessarily mean um, buy a retainer every 10 hours or whatever it is every single day. It's about engaging with other people, you know, just the commenting, putting out a post maybe, but just being seen, just mm. being seen and being consistent with what your like your brand your personal brand like who you are because unfortunately running your own business you are your own business whether you like it or not being comfortable with that and just sticking to it every day almost to the point where you are bored so that if someone said what do you do you could say it off the top of your head without even thinking about it um and just engaging posting getting getting involved with other things and just trusting the process you know it's because that I found the biggest difference between employment and running your own business because you don't have any of that in a business at all it being employed that is and so your business it's you're starting to do really well and then the pandemic hits what happens then so just before the pandemic I had transitioned out of the legal industry because I suddenly realised that just because I'd been employed in the legal industry doesn't mean I have to work with those within it. Bit of a mm. eureka moment. So I started to work with the people in the property industry. It's a quite a natural overlap with that. Um, like the property world, still do. But I found that, and I'm going to make a bit of a general sweep, sweeping statement, mm. but I found that a lot of the people in the property industry would use VAs in Philippines and things like that. And they were far from my ideal client because they were really tight, to be quite honest with you. Well, the they're paying them like, I, I, got an, I got an email yesterday from a Filipino VA agency offering to work for IPA for $5 an hour, five American dollars an hour. And they offered me four hours free of charge. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, I just you can't compete with yeah. that, can you? You cannot compete with that. Um and I start. I started to have a quite a big wobble at that point because I was thinking, if they're charging that, how on earth am I ever going to buy food, let alone pay for my mortgage and everything else? So I kind of bounced around a bit like a pinball machine, kind of thinking mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. Um, and then I came across... Um, a lady on LinkedIn so I obviously got myself on LinkedIn can't remember the, there is a bit of a gap there but I can't remember what really plugged it, it can't be too much of a gap Helen Pritchard now Helen Tudor found her on LinkedIn. Helen. Yeah, yeah I've not accessed she, her services but I've heard of her no oh, she saved my business um and the, I, I say that but I absolutely mean that I've told her to her face that she did um and she did because I found her on LinkedIn and basically what she does she's one of many because there are many on LinkedIn that helps you find leads on LinkedIn so I knew I still had that little seed in me that I hadn't quite satisfied but I hadn't I didn't quite know how to bring it to the forefront didn't quite know where to put it I had all this energy and I hadn't quite found the people to serve yet anyway so she helped she goes through how to work out your ideal client takes it all the way back to basics um Sorry, my electrician's playing with the electrics. Um, <laughs> it looked quite, looked quite nice, yeah. like a spa yeah. effect. Then. Yeah. No, no, we're having my house renovations the spa. <laughs> the house holder on the call. So, um, so what was it? Yeah, so she goes through how to do your ideal client work, all the basic stuff of putting yourself out there. And mm -hmm. her um, mantra is the four posts, as much as you like. So call to action, videos, story posts, and testimonials. 
um, and you just post them as much as you want to. Um, and if you really, really need to earn and push it out there, then you should be posting all the time. But I've never posted all the time. I've just done it kind of as and when. Mm. And I don't know why I did a series back in January, years, probably four years ago now, once a day in the life of a private PA, because I'd come across the concept of a private PA, I used to read the job descriptions. And that was when I knew I'd found somewhere to put this like fire in me. I'd rung up all the agencies, applied for permanent jobs. I was that prepared to walk away from being a VA because I knew that was for me. It was about the whole personal stuff, you know, running their personal lives, working with like, household staff. I, knew, I said to Mark, that's it. I said, that is me. I knew it. Anyway, a part-time role came up um, in Seven Oaks in Kent, which is only about half an hour away from me, two days a week, part-time private PA. And I hadn't left my law firm at that point. So I knew that I could do that alongside. Would have been a bit of a stretch, obviously, with the children. But I knew that if I did that, I could then leave and it would do that. Anyway, cut a long story short, I did get the job. She, she, it was um, Judy, her name was, the, the, the older lady that I worked with. And she, she said, I just really liked your name. Abigail's quite a traditional name. Thankfully for me, the other ladies that had been interviewed were called Kelly and Tanya and like Chanel and modern names that she didn't particularly like so you know <laughs> whether that was a sign from the universe I don't know but I got the job and it was the best job I've ever had in my life even to date Judy was 85 I think she was 88 when she died but I ran the estate so I went down there once a week mm. took my slippers took my lunch opened the post with her just dealt with everything I organized the housekeeper sorted out a dog that was deaf had to go and find you know, the Jaffa, the dog in the garden when, when he's deaf, which was interesting. Um, you know, got the ten tennis courts renovated and just just did whatever. But I basically was running my her life, but as a mum kind of to her. So I, I've got this real caring side because I'm very conscientious and I love to bring that into the role. Mm. Um, so anyway, I worked with the family for two years um, and Judy did pass away which was why the role came to an end. She had a nasty fall and she was very petite. So there wasn't much of her to really pull her through. Mm. Um, but I've got wonderful testimonials from her children and I went to her funeral and yeah, and it, it was a wonderful role that I think came out of nowhere for a really good reason. Judy and sounds like a bit of an angel type. Like you, she was were, you were in that place exactly the right time. I mean, I, yeah. I'm a bit of a believer in fate and you're supposed yeah you're supposed to be where you are at that point in your life even if it's not that great yeah um, absolutely and I remember traveling to the job agency at the time they were in Parsons Green which is so west London to I where know, I am I used to live near there yeah oh, okay yeah so from Kent it took me nearly three hours on god knows how many trains but oh, I read the job description and it was just for me and I said to Mark I'm getting that job so it was, I was employed by the family, but I worked there on a Thursday and I worked in London Monday and Tuesday. So I was only off Wednesday and Friday with the kid, with the kids that we just had two at the time. And it was tough, but it was so important to me personally to get it, to prove to myself that actually there was somewhere to put this fire mm. and I found it and I found it so satisfying it was such oh, I loved being down there it was like a darling buds of may type house oh wow um, yeah really really traditional what I would call a private PA role so anyway in that time I left London but knew I had to build up the role there weren't any more hours down where I was working so I actually started something that you don't even know Vic and I still regret it not being a success um when Judy died I knew that I wanted to work with other people similar to her mm. but being in her 80s you don't tend to find clients in their 80s particularly it would be their grown-up children so I then set up a business called Ch Cherished Family Services which was for supporting grown-up children and their elderly parents because how many of us as professionals oh, wow. work in London yeah you don't know I don't I need to talk about this on LinkedIn but how many People work in London, mums and the dads have got kids, their own like younger kids that have got elderly parents that they've got no time to go and see. That was the, the gap that this business would have filled. So it would have been a PA role still, but it would have been 
largely companionship. I yeah. didn't do any um, actual caring or like, you know, physical cleaning or anything. So I liaised with carers um, and they all had an interview process with me because obviously Ooh. I knew mm. Judy really well. I mean, she was very, um, <clears throat> very typically uh, not cantankerous. I don't mean that horribly, but she was very, she'd just really speak her mind. And that if we had a carer that hadn't put her hair up neatly or wasn't well presented, she said, I'm not having her coming near me. What a state. You know, she and you know, quite rightly like, so. Yeah, she just knew how she wanted things and absolutely she right around her how she wanted yeah, them to be. Absolutely. Yeah. And she I loved that about her. So I I felt there must be more elderly people that weren't necessarily widows, because Judy had been widowed twice, but where the elderly, not elderly, the uh, adult children would love someone to just go and go around a couple of times a week help out with some paperwork, make sure the house is all right, go and spend an hour, talk about the war or whatever it might be. Mm. To be honest, I think that would probably be gold to so many different people, but I couldn't find any more adult children that fitted that um, remit. Funny me, because you think, given what's going on in society and how it all works, mm. like you said, the, the grown-up children rushing in, having to put in the hours for their career. Mm. I mean, that that business... It, I mean, it might even be worth another punt at soon. I'd love to. That, yeah, I'd absolutely love I just, to do it again. Um, mm, I, I bought just, some domain and yeah, it's, but it, so I built some really good relationships with some very affluent care homes um, because I knew my target market. So I went to go and visit care homes. But what I found myself doing was sitting down talking to all the old people. I'd be the same. I'd be the I same. Loved it. Oh, yeah. I, and I loved it because these people have got so much knowledge and funny stories, but they've got, they, they either can't express themselves very well or, you know, they're given some pipe cleaners to play with and not, you know, unfortunately not all old people want to do that. They just want a good conversation and, but because they're in the care home and they're in a very affluent care home because their children can afford to put them there. Mm. But, I couldn't necessarily access the adult children. So it is absolutely something I want to pick up on. You know what? Honestly, I do think it's worth another punt at that. And and I, for anyone that's over 70 listening, I'm not saying you're old, but something happened. Obviously, it was my 40th birthday last week. And I don't normally celebrate my birthday, but um, I'm... It didn't sound like you did, really, either. <laughs> well, I actually I actually did. So um, on the... Didn't on the Friday, uh, which was when I was 40 but on the Saturday my neighbour Amanda our dogs are best friends oh, and that's right. she's got a daughter and a son and husband and they said Vic why don't you come over for dinner and we'll have like an Indian night like Andy cooks a mean curry mm -hmm. and I was like well everyone knows that I've been training to cook Indian food of Harry Gotra for three four years mm -hmm. and I said I'll bring some dishes as well and then um, Amanda and I and a woman called Jo in the village who's a single woman on her own with dogs and I said, should we invite Joe? Because we've all been going to aerobics together. Mm -hmm. And then um, my next door, my next door neighbour, Steve, he is the loveliest bloke ever. Like he's mm -hmm. 71. And um, his wife Anita passed away just before we moved down here. So it was her mm -hmm. third bout of breast cancer. And Anita, people in the village have told us she was like the life and soul. Steve's quite quiet and reserved, mm -hmm. but Anita was apparently, you know, into Amdram and you know, oh, yeah. got involved in the village committee and and they were married for over 20 years. And so I said, Steve, why don't you come along as well? Because I know you like a curry. And so we had this lovely night last Saturday night, um, lots of Indian food, lots of Prosecco. I'm dry January, but that's the only night I break it. Um, and we had this lovely evening. I didn't get to bed till 4 a.m. Sunday. It's been a while <laughs> since I've done Brilliant. that. But I saw Steve yesterday and he said it was so lovely. He said, Vic, I realised I haven't been out of an evening mm. in even anywhere for well, since Anita died three years ago. Oh, oh bless him. Yeah. And I was just it just got me thinking. So like when you're talking about this, I mean, you know, Steve's still able bodied and and things like that. And you know, he walks his dog miles every day. But it just got me thinking that you get to a certain age in the UK mm. and companionship is massive. Yeah. 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 Um, and then if you if you are elderly and you're not able to access technology, mm. that instantly isolates you even further. Um, so, yeah, so that didn't work out. I had to shelve it because I wasn't earning anything at that point, you know, because Judy had passed away. 
um, I had nothing going on. So I was like, right, Mark had said to me, because Mark, my husband's very, very employee mindset. He's been with TFL <clears throat> for a long time. He's like, right, we need to earn X amount. You're not earning anything. I've even had to find financially compensate for you anyway, because you didn't really make anything in the first couple of years. I was hell bent on having it work. I was not going back to being told what to do. Yeah. Especially now I knew that this private PA thing was a thing. So I then took it upon myself to go on link LinkedIn. I did the once in a day in one once in a once in a day in the life of a private PA, that's right. Yeah. Series of videos across the week. And basically all I did was use various things that I'd done with Judy and just highlighted what a private PA was. Mm. Spoke to myself on video, never done it before, no subtitles, because any faff is just not me. <laughs> um, and just put it out there on LinkedIn. And I started to just engage and comment. I mean, the only people that I did attract were other PAs typically. Um, but even so, I still started to grow a network. Um, and basically, that was how I started to really make the transition. And I listened to what Helen said, and I implemented everything. So I was posting, I was engaging, um, and listening to her advice it did absolutely change my business because I'd come across a lady called Anita, who I'm still in contact with today, who introduced me to my main client, who is still with me today, nearly four years later. Um, uh, my main client's a COO of a large construction company down here in Kent. And I try as much as I can, but I run her life, um, mainly personal life, but I now do expenses and other bits like that in the business, because as you know, there is no divide between personal and professional life. No matter how many people try for that whole work-life balance, it's complete BS. Um, so, yeah, so I've got Lindsay, my main client now, um, which was great. So, but it never dawned on me to have more than one because I'd only ever had one, really. And that's that whole employee mindset coming to fruition without me knowing. So when COVID hit my business went from like 50 hours a month to about four. So COVID was a big wet fish in the face for me. Lindsay shortened my hours to hardly anything as you know, many people did. And I, I sulked for about three weeks to be quite honest with you. I did know, I didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to do. I was, I was in panic. It was yep. such a shock though. And the biggest shock was more mm. for small business owners. And I mean, I sat there and said, right, that's it. ipa has gone. Like, mm. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and as I was, well, I've only ever been self-employed, um, a self-employed business owner. I felt exactly the same. I, I actually didn't know what to do. I'd done all this work, learned all this stuff for one person to pull the rug out underneath me. So after three weeks of sulking and sitting in the garden and wondering how the hell I'm going to pull it out of the bag again, because Mark was saying to me even more, he was like, right, I know you've pulled it out of the bag, but Lindsay's gone. You, you know, there are no clients, you know, COVID's hit. There won't be any, no one's going to need a PA. I still had this thing. I was looking at me as if to say, you can, I can't say it, but you know, you can forget it, not being employed, but I couldn't say anything because I had no evidence because obviously COVID was brand new. So I did the same thing again, all over LinkedIn, all over LinkedIn, absolutely hell bent on, there must be, there must be businesses, there must be people that are still running and need, and need that support where they're still so busy in their work, but they've got no life. Anyway, yeah, I turned it around. So I got another client in July that year, which was quite quickly. She was with me for two years, um, kind of shot myself in the foot, really, because I'd organised her so much that by the time the two years had come round, <laughs> she was like, Abby, you've trained me to do it. You've trained me to time block. You've trained me to put contingencies in. I now put my own travel time in. And now I've got all this extra time that you've managed to enforce on me. I can go to my yoga. I can do all this stuff. So I was like, oh, <laughs> OK. So she happily left me it was like sending my first child off to school almost um but you know that, that's something else I've learned as a business owner in that clients don't have to stay with you the entire time you know we're not employed mm. um and I've basically picked up clients ever since then 
Um, and it was about 18 months ago that I hit my capacity in terms of time. Um, cause I kept, I just kept keeping, taking them on. I just, it, you know, there are so many clients at some point, Mark was like, well, I know it's going really well, but we don't see you anymore. And we kind of like dinner again, if that's all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I just got addicted to doing the work and being on LinkedIn and getting more clients in and, you know, uh, I don't blame you because they say small business is like a famine or a feast. Yeah. And, and when you get into the feast stage, you're kind of like you don't want to lose it. And the problem is the last three years has been so rocky for small businesses and it's left us in such a vulnerable state. Like all the help from the government departments was flung out to PLC and and big, you know, firms. It wasn't given to us. So. Well, I did really fight hard. I got a business bounce back then. So I did really fight for that yeah, um, because I did need it because of obviously losing Lindsay at the time. And that by the time I got it, I mean, unfortunately, all, everyone and his wife got one, which, um, you know, ruined it for the minority. But it did get me out of a really sticky hole, really yeah. sticky hole. So that was great. Um, and then I've basically just tried to, as we said at the beginning of the call, remember that you've got to keep on the consistency with the marketing because it's very easy and I'm still I still suffer with it now once you're busy with the work you take your hands off of the pump with the marketing because yeah. you're doing the work it's it's wearing those two hats so it's about just again time blocking coming back to using our own PA skills time blocking you don't always have to be on socials for an hour. It doesn't always have to be doing that. And it's about planning your own time. And that's when I started building my freelance team, which is what I've got now. Mm. Um, but in terms of rebranding for Poppins PA, which is what I am today, and I think I've been Poppins PA for three years now in January, um, I rebranded it based on my role that I had with Judy and I took the elements of all the other roles that I had So look at the role that I had with Tom, another role that I'd had working with another lady where personal elements had really come back. That was a local role that I had in Maidstone. I put them all together. Um, and Helen talks about the joy, joy, love, something else, triangle. She talks about one of her sort of real elements of um, uh, pillars of content. And it's a what you love doing because again when you're employed you don't ask what you're really doing you you get given stuff to do when you're a business owner you can choose so now I wrote my LinkedIn profile based on what I like doing because again then when you get you get given stuff you're asking for stuff that you love to do so the work that I do now, apart from expenses I've got to be clear about that I don't like doing expenses I've never, but, I've never liked doing them never. Oh. Um, but now I, I do love what I'm doing. So, yeah. And then I built a team um, and I took on another client yesterday. So it will go with with one of my new members. I took on two PAs in the last, well, in December, I took on two more PAs. Um, and we basically, what Poppins PA does is aid the lives of high achieving women live the life that they want to live, because I think it's perfectly OK to live a life in the fast lane with children, whether you have children or not, but a lot of my clients do have kids, um, and still be a mum. I don't see the need to want to be a super mum or superwoman or any other of those ridiculous badges that get blown around. But you've got to realise that you can't do it without support. Now, we plug that gap, obviously. So we mainly provide personal support. So we'll... Um, check children's school emails so for any other mother on the call you'll know how explosively ridiculous that can get my son's gone in dressed as an Egyptian today in the middle of January which is completely ridiculous <laughs> so I've wrapped him in bandages um so maintaining the mum part of your life as well as hitting corporate targets and all the rest of it and even going on date nights and you know even you're like you know you don't have kids Vic but your life's really busy you've got this whole you've got this whole you know fitness thing going on you've got EPA you've got a husband you've got a dog so it doesn't really matter what lives we lead it's about just creating our own balance um, and I believe balance comes from setting those boundaries that are right for you yeah. um, and in that 
is about getting support in whichever way that might look like for you Mm. so for our clients it's basically diary management and being a gatekeeper Um, and we carve out time for our clients so that you know if we were to work for you for example Vic we'd make sure that your time to do your workouts and go out with Rossi was scheduled into your diary because that's what you like to do as Victoria Mm. and that is the heart of what I profess at my at the business and that's what I I don't train necessarily the, the freelance PAs that come on but it's really important to me that we're all doing a kind of the same delivery to mm. the clients um and that's what they come on board with us because although it you know you can do diary management and all the rest of it we do the extra Mary Poppins level above that because I don't see the point in losing your own identity to work or be a mum why can't we have our own identity and do those those two things as well absolutely and so just for anyone that's listening Helen Tudor was it a course you kind of signed up to do with her or was it some sort of 10 day challenge or um she does do a free LinkedIn sprint challenge um and I was a part of the LinkedIn mastermind but you do not have to sign up to any course with Helen her Mm. free content is as good as the LinkedIn mastermind the only reason I signed up to the mastermind was because I wanted the accountability and I wanted to be able to ask questions and tweak what I was doing because I needed instant results well I mean it goes when you pay for something you're more committed and like you said you've got the accountability when you're constantly getting stuff for free yeah there's no yeah there's no traction in it exactly exactly um I mean she's not it's not her main thing anymore she does do other things now but if you were to scroll back um, and look at her LinkedIn profile, uh, it would still all be there. And it, it, it was just, if you want something badly enough and you're consistent with it, you're going to get the results. And Poppins PA is an absolute proof of that. Mm. And so let's look at you um, personally. Now, just before we came on, you you kind of threw out there that you're training for the London Marathon with your husband. Yes. So tell us a little bit, are you, doing, are you both doing it for different charities or are you? So I was really jammy and got a place on the ballot first time application. Um, so I know that will really rile a lot of listeners. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, who knows how the London Marathon is actually run. Um, but yeah, I got a place on the ballot. So I don't need to raise any money for charity, but I will be because Mark did get a place. Uh, very recently it was confirmed running for the children's society so i will be raising money for him so we need to raise two thousand for the marathon for that um so we are runners anyway um not quite as serious marathon runners as i before i'd applied because when i'd applied i thought the marathon was going to be in october because it was last year and it was because of covid it all got thrown out didn't yeah. it yeah but mark said well you do realize that it's in april next year so obviously we've only had five months to train because you don't get your place applied and confirmed until late October so it's quite a lot of pressure Mm. but do you know what yeah it'll be fine um like I say we are runners anyway and we're up to 16 miles so far which is quite a good place to be in mid-January um we've had a couple of runs that haven't gone according to plan which is a bit of a shame but again like I say mid-January that's okay because we're still doing the mileage across the week mm. it's just about getting the stamina up in the one run um so we were out yesterday in gale force winds and torrential rain which was interesting and for but, any international people listening at the moment obviously we're in the thick of winter in the uk yes. <laughs> whether it's diabolical at the moment yes it's definitely um wet but when i'm out in the rain and the wind and just anything else that's flying around in the air i actually really like it I run through the puddles because do you know what? You're out in it. Mm. There's no point moaning about the wind and the rain. It's January. Well, I've to walk embrace like, it. Exactly. Five, six miles a day with all... Rossi have to, you know. Exactly. So it's it's all about bad clothing. And we've been running long enough to wear the right stuff. And I mean, I don't actually wear much anyway when I go out running because I get hot. So I'm in shorts, even in the wind and the rain because you're moving around and I actually really embrace it and I'll almost say to the universe or whoever do you know what thanks because like you don't get to see it indoors you just get you put a light on and pull the curtains and 
it's January. The sun will shine again in May and June, you know, just get out there and enjoy it. I mean, I'll put the, kid, put the kids' wellies on and take them out and embrace a bit of mud. So right. I'm actually really enjoying our training. Um, well, you do, as a family, you do what many people in the UK know now, which is very famous, Park Run, which is every okay. Saturday morning. Are they all at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, UK wide, all at nine o'clock. Yeah, make it easy. And then the junior park runs on a Sunday are at nine o'clock as well, which our youngest goes to. Um, and he has just run, I think it's his 12th adult park run. So he's eight. So he's got his T-shirt now um, and he does. So he does 5K on a Saturday and then 2K on a Sunday morning. And he runs the speeds that you used to run. So his PB, I mean, it's drilled into my head because he tells everyone 24, 16. <gasps> and he's eight. So, I yeah, that's really managed that. And I was in my late 20s, early 30s. Then. Yeah, that is. My, incredible. Yeah, it is. And he. But he loves it and everyone, everyone knows him and he know he's up and ready for running Saturday. So he, he really enjoys it, which is obviously really important to us. But we go out as a three. I mean, although there's five of us, our 16 year old isn't interested at all anymore. Mm -hmm. And our 12 year old, our daughter used to be a very good runner. But again, she'll run the Sunday 2K, but the 5K is just a bit much for her. So but we do tourist ones. So you can go to any other park run in the UK and be a tourist, which is great. And then if you've got the park run app, which we have, you can then play the games. You can do the A to Z game. You can do the park runs like for the 5th of November. We did G, which was gunpowder over in near Hemel Hempstead. I think that is in the UK. So we'll go to a different one. And if we go to a different one, we always go to a different cafe. So we get to see different parts of the UK. It's a bit of a morning out. It's really exciting. And we love it. We're real, real park run fans. We love it. And it well, you know, I've signed up to do it. Oh, um, I'm so pleased. Yeah, I'm hoping the first one will be this Saturday. We're under weather warnings in Dorset at the moment. So I'm just waiting to hear if it's actually still going yeah. ahead. Because it had, there's been quite a bit of flooding here the last yeah. week and stuff. But um, yeah, I definitely am going to start it this year. Really great. I mean, it's ne any park run I've ever run. So even when I started them back in August 21, I've never felt like it's a race. I've never, ever thought about, I mean, I do race people at the end now because I like a bit of a sprint finish, but <laughs> and I'll say, and I'll, you know, if they're 50 yards, 100 yards in front of them, I'll look at them and, and then think, right, I'm going to beat you. Mm. And then when I'll parallel with them, I'll even say, I'm going to completely like flatten you. And like, because they, they, they don't know you, they're like, what? I'm like, come on, race me. And then at the end, they're like, oh, thank you so much. Like, you got me a PB. Because when people are at the end, they're like, oh, I'm at the end now. But when I'm at the end, I'm like, no, I'm at the end. I need to not knock off three, four seconds again. And then they'll come over to you at the end and say, oh, thank you so much. You know, I haven't run like that in ages. And it's like, no, it's great. And everyone I've ever met at the park run community is super friendly. So yeah. if you are looking to get back into running, I would highly recommend it. I mean, I should get commission because the amount of people I've got to sign up to part run <laughs> is crazy. Yes, yeah, so if the founder's listening, you need to email me. <laughs> well, you know, um, you know, one of our members, and she's in the Facebook group, but she's actually just joined Park Run as their EA. Um, oh, really? To the, board, to the board? Yeah, I'll, I'll introduce you. I'm hoping oh, wow. to get her on one of the pods. Um, oh, wow. But she's she's like a Park Run addict and now Same. she's actually working for them so that is like the dream ea role oh wow well, yeah, yeah honestly yeah. i appreciate um so oh. we are sort of nearing the end now and i wanted to get in because you are a business owner um who inspires you in business or who um, has inspired you who do you look up to well apart from helen um yeah. so helen's on more of a bit more of a cellular level because you know she started from the same place that we did she's got two girls and a single she was a single mum at the time um so people like Helen <clears throat> but I really like people like uh like Sarah Blakely if you're looking really up there because again she's very real um there's an Australian lady called Tori Archbold who I am a very big advocate of um oh god who are Carrie Green I adore Carrie Green um because again she she says things like it is um she's done incredibly well but also she she talks about the warts and all yeah. she says about what she's really doing well in you know she's not she doesn't hold any bars in what she's earning or how well she's done on it but actually she'll go do you know what in order to get there this is what I've had to go through mm -hmm. um, and I emailed BBC4 Women's Hour the other day off the back 
of one of Carrie Green's podcasts because she said, I got PR by emailing woman, Woman's Hour every day for like six months or whatever it was. So guess what I'm doing? Doing exactly the same thing. I'm just emailing them every single day. Um, so it, it's people like her, really. I mean, there's probably more people. Um, other people in the business that I really, I talk to a lot, Jennifer Chamberlain, I'm really good friends with, who's out in Paris. Um, who else do I talk to? Obviously you, Anel. Anel's fantastic. Anel is my social media lady who is amazing. Um, my own PA, Rebecca Cullen. She is an amazing PA who knocks the socks off of any skills that I've got. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's about it's about our strengths, right? So yeah. it's, it's just about finding people that sit well with you, whether they're earning 3 million, 50 grand, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter who they are. If if your gut is telling you that you want to follow them, just follow them. doesn't matter where they are in their business. It's just about finding what fits you for where you are in your journey. Yeah, and you're absolutely right on that. I, I realised because I worked and I worked and worked out a lot over Christmas, mm -hmm. as you well know. Um, but I realised when I was reflecting on business that like I'm drawn to business people from really gritty backgrounds, like who've yeah. come from quite tough backgrounds. I'm just drawn to that because it's reflective of my own. That's probably why I ended up working um, mm -hmm. for Jacqueline Gold and Vanessa Gold and people yeah, like yeah. that because... Mm -hmm. It's not all, you know, been easier. You know, that's probably why I joined Carrie's organisation as well. And people mm -hmm. like Lisa Johnson, who, yeah. you know, it, it's not just that kind of rags to riches story. It's people who've been determined to like, overcome the odds. I've realised that's just such a pull for me because. Yeah, yeah same. And they've all been resonates. consistent. Yeah. All of them have been consistent. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, like, I'm in Lisa Johnson's world. Not so much anymore because I have pulled yeah. away from Facebook. Um, and the main reason for that is that I just can't spin that many plates. Yeah. Um, I've gone all in on LinkedIn. That's where I get probably easily 95% of my clients. Mm -hmm. um, and even if I'm looking for PAs, I tend to get them from private PA communities, Yeah, um, which tend to be more so on LinkedIn than on Facebook. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it's just about finding your own, like, try. I know they call it a tribe, but once you start talking to people about what you want to do, because you might not be there with what you want to do and the people that you want to serve, like I was back in when I was working for Tom in London. But when I'd found Judy, I'd found my kind of struck gold moment. Mm. Keep with it. Just keep looking, keep telling people what it is you want to deliver. I mean, I've got a call with Lucy Brazier today because I'm really passionate about getting more involved, and that's something I've never done before, getting more involved with the PA side about helping PAs find their fire. Because I had that fire for like ridiculous amount of years, but I didn't know how to channel it. Mm. So I wanted to talk to Lucy and you at a later date about how to help PAs find that and not give up on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I my view, having been an EA for so long, I... I do think the PA EA side of the industry has gone backwards. I, I think there's been a lot of great work done, but I just think that PAs and EAs more than ever before are so dissatisfied and bored in their roles. And it's and just make, become yeah. more and more and more apparent over the last year. I think there's so much work to be done. And I also there's like the significant shift in the working world now, which has been done by millennials and Gen Z where they're not going to sit in these professions for 40 years now they're you know we've we're doing like some big pieces of work at Ypres accepting that people are going to come over for from other professions uh, like they have like we've had a policewoman who's left the force and become a PA mm -hmm. and she might only do it for five years get bored and then go on and move to do something that's the working world now and I just don't think the rest of the PA industry is caught up with that yeah. and those shifts and mm -hmm. and that's because you've sort of touched them and the confidence isn't there they've just sort of you know lumbering into these roles every day clocking in nine to five and it's just not enough for many yeah. people now it's well um, and it wasn't enough for me that's exactly no, what I did. yeah making that transition into being a VA is huge um but then they lose confidence because they don't necessarily know how to do it I mean obviously there's loads of people that train that mm. transition but I would I'm contemplating maybe assisting from a lifestyle point of view yeah. So not necessarily setting VAs up, but yeah. 
helping with the niching, the marketing, the stuff that I really, really had to learn and the stuff that I am still consistent with today that has made the big difference. Yeah. Um, you know, like what what do client when, when clients challenge you on your, your hourly rate, how do you deal with that? That kind of stuff. I can have those conversations now because I've dealt with that. Um, so yeah, it's just about it, I want to bring awareness to the fact that it's okay to hold your own when you're transitioning into PA into yeah, VA. Because I don't even call myself a VA. I call myself a PA because I, I truly believe that that's exactly what I am. I'm remote. But I see VAs more of specialists in social media or in Funnels, the tech. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't see myself as a VA. Yeah, and we had this big company. conversation with Tom and Leanne about this, like the, what is an online business manager? And, you know, a lot mm. of the business groups I'm in, they're constantly saying, I need a VA. And then it's like, I need someone who can build um, a funnel, that knows mail a lie, um, active campaign. And of course, a lot of PAs wouldn't have been taught. They're not, no. unless you, you've worked in a startup as a PA hmm. and for full-time employed, you probably never had access to all of that because you've been in your department. Uh, exactly. So, yeah, it's really interesting. I think on the VA side of the industry, there's going to be a lot of change over the coming years as well. Hmm. Um, I just, yeah, it just feels now that we've come, I say we've come out of COVID, but the numbers are, rising again massively um but now we're sort of starting to get back to normal people have got that real bite to move careers and mm. change their lives and things like that so exactly yeah so um but yeah it can be done um but you've really got to realize that you've got to be consistent with putting yourself out there mm. and you've also got to be okay with you're never going to know it all so even if you start putting yourself out there because instantly you think well what do I say Mm. where have you come from talk about your career what have you been doing that, and that's it people buy from people and that's as, that's as complicated as business gets yeah. that's it every client that's ever come on board with me whether they work with me or not has always said I want to work with you because mm. I talk my copy is me talking um but again that's the whole personal element coming out because I'm that's the that's the core of my business it's the whole personal like working with you not for you mm. um, I, I stripped it back right back to I want to work for the person who's the person you know yeah. what do they like in life um so yeah I've, I've kind of scooped up Mary Poppins and brought her back into 2023 <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> it was probably due an overhaul and update yeah old Mary Poppins mantra well thank you so much for your time today I think anybody I mean it's such an inspiring story and obviously we do have known each other for a little while now but you've there's bits about you I've learned today that I didn't know and I still think that it, that other business could really yeah, cherished mm. be something yeah. mm. um it's just throwing that out there but you've given again so many nuggets away to people that are just maybe just sitting there thinking mm -hmm. is this uh potential for me to make the move to self-employed um mm -hmm. over the coming years because apparently the figures that have been released recently by the office of national St uh, statistics have said that there's a massive drop in the people who are registered as self-employed oh, um, really? since the summer yeah and i think that's down to the cost of living and when mm -hmm. inflation gets back under control whenever that is they're saying next year and um, hopefully mm -hmm. end of this year early next i think that's when we'll see it rise again so mm -hmm. For people who are sitting there sort of planning that in their heads um, yeah yeah but even i mean i i see this current time as i will just make more money because instantly i had a client say to me last week i'm not sure i can justify you anymore i think we're going to have to like let you go i said okay that's fine and she's an accountant she runs her own accountancy practice i said well people need you they don't necessarily want you mm. you should be making more money but because she's got that fixed mindset and she's still working with me within 24 hours she changed her mind she came back and I laughed out loud I was like what are you what are you doing she well, said you're right she said just because a lot of people are losing money losing their jobs she said there is always more money there is always more money yeah. and that, I absolutely believe that through and through yeah I think I've been up and down with that mindset and um, but that's because I've been the queen of freebies for the last three years which obviously I've had to get out of and um, and I've given an interview to a national magazine this week talking about that oh, as yes possibly. you have yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So that's really interesting. Um, but you're right, because if I was a VA now and I do, I mean, as you know, I do more EA parachute jobs. So I, you know, I'll get pulled out of VA retirement, clean up the mess and yeah. then recruit somebody permanent full time for them. That's I've that's how it, um, I think the some of the people I've supported over the last few years for those short periods have described. That's how they describe me as a parachute PA yeah. that I, you know, that's I could drop in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out yeah. And, and I, don't, I don't come out of retirement for just anybody. <laughs> um, but I think, um, yeah, I think. And I've lost my train of thought a little bit there, but the VA side, I think it, for me, it's it's still really, really interesting. Um, I, yeah, there's always I think, more money. Yeah, there is. And if I was a VA, that's it. If I was a VA at this moment in time, what, where, if I'd be looking for clients, I'm in, really into my fitness. I'm on the 75 day um, soft challenge. The fitness industry, the nutrition, the health, the, that industry is wild at the moment. If I was going to go searching for clients right now mm -hmm. and I was tallying it up with something that's of value to me, then that's where I'd be going because it is literally wild at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it and it's what do people need right now? And well, as your VA, yeah, yeah. Give them Probably. what they need right now and you will develop, you'll find out what you like and what you don't like for sure. Yeah. Um, and just problem solve, just yeah. problem solve. Give them what they need, and you can move on and do something else. The joy of running your own business is versatility. Pivot, yeah, yeah. enjoy it. You know, you can change it. You're not employed anymore. Um, it is scary, but I have to come back. There's always more money. There's always more money. I mean, it's. I need to earn um, a bit more. My tax has gone up. I might be going limited this year. Sorry, I'm on a bean bag because I've been banished into my front room because my electricians <laughs> are here today um but it's not something I've got in the bank but I'll make it happen I'll make it happen there's always more money because if I've got the clients that I've got that's proof to me that there are more of them mm. so I will just be more consistent um and just you know put out recommendation and following up on old leads is huge as well talking to other people that never you know necessarily followed through a year ago six months ago where are they at now can you recommend them to somebody else you know there's lots of different possibilities so it's mm. it's not always about diary management gatekeeping there's loads of services that can be provided even if it's just for sort of a six month stop gap you'll be surprised at the opportunities that that can create mm. well again thank you so much <laughs> this is the, like, i think this is one of those podcasts that will just get played back repeatedly when people are oh. looking to make that transition <laughs> Um, but I really appreciate you giving up your time today. No, it's been a great show. show. Thank you. Um, and, you know, when you're self-employed, every hour is losing money when you do things like this technically. Or, well, it's promoting <laughs> brand, but you know what I mean? Like, you've given Yeah, you have time. to. I mean, yeah. this is about me being consistent. So this isn't about me getting clients. This is just yeah. about me. It's good. It's always good practice to talk about yourself and your business. And it's all, it, all these things that I've said is a good reminder to me Mm. about what I should be doing and reminding myself um so yeah I mean some days are busier than others so I have got lots of work to do but calls like this are really important and we have been trying to get this done for a little while so no it's yeah. been really good well thank you very much no you're welcome Vic thank you Thanks. well I hope everyone's enjoyed listening to me Babylon <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they will Thank you for joining this episode of the Assistant Lab. If you enjoyed this content, you know what you need to do. Feel free to share it and help us grow our subscriber base. Join us again next time. And until then, keep experimenting, innovating and improving your skill sets.